so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your attention. Um, before we get started, I'm going to make sort of the same announcements that I would make at the beginning of a normal grant review session. Um, so I just want to just remind everyone of the confidentiality, both in terms of the content of the application as well as the number of applications received in this category. Um, pretty much everything that we discuss stays here today. Um, do not discuss anything about any of the applications you'll receive outside of this meeting. Um, we're here to do important work, um, not only to identify some of the best grants in this that were submitted, um, but also to provide feedback to young investigators. So I want to remind everyone to please keep your comments constructive, and when you're drafting, revising your reviews to send back to um, the applicant, please keep in mind that constructive feedback is helpful. We want to give them feedback so that they're able to resubmit a stronger application, whether it's to us or to another agency. Um, we have a variety of skills on the committee, um, clinical research, basic science, epidemiology, methodology. Um, so each of those strengths will come into play in different applications today. We're only reviewing one right now, but please lean on each other's strengths throughout the review. Um, and for those of you who are not assigned reviewers, meaning all of you, um, if there is something that you hear today that you um, feel that you have the expertise or would like to comment on, please feel free to do so. Um, now let's get into the review process itself. Um, so the first step, just for every grant that we review, we'll, we will excuse patient, we will identify and excuse um, participants with a conflict of interest, which we heard about earlier, would be um, anyone who's on the grant in a key personnel role, or who's from the same institution as the applicant, or has a sort of close research relationship, close professional relationship with the applicant. Um, then each of the reviewers will give their scores, just their numeric score that they assign, their overall impact score. Um, the primary reviewer will provide their comments on the grant, and then each of the secondary and the tertiary reviewers will provide their comments. As a rough um, time frame, let's have the primary reviewer spend about 10 minutes, um, and let's try five minutes, minutes or, <laughs> or less. Yes, um, or less. <laughs> um, and five minutes or less for the other two, so we're keeping this at, you know, 20 minutes. Ideally, we'd be at 15, 10 to 15 after those, and then um, we can open it up for more general discussion. Um, when you're giving your secondary and tertiary reviews, please don't feel the need to repeat comments that were already raised by the um, primary reviewer. If we do a really good job, if our primary and secondary reviewers are really good, our tertiary reviewer may have nothing to add, and that is perfectly fine. Um, after everyone discusses, we'll have each of the three reviewers give their updated scores. And then if anyone in the audience or who's, who's voting wants to go outside of that range, we'll just have you indicate that you're voting outside the range um, and state your a brief reason why. And sorry, the range of the three reviewers is the range for the rest of the group to score. Um, everyone will enter their final score. After we do that, then we will move on to discuss human, any human subjects and budgetary concerns if they exist. So any questions about the process? All right. The grant we're reviewing today is not a career development grant, so there will not be um, a training plan component, just in case anyone is wondering why, because you're writing that in your grant. All right. So why don't we, who? Primary? Yeah, so I guess scores. Yeah, scores. Uh, I'm the just your overall reviewer. impact score. Yeah, my overall score was a four. The secondary overall score was a six. I'm the tertiary for this uh, proposal, and I gave it a five. Okay, guys, so this is a um, R21, R33 from Dr. Stopira. Dr. Stopira is a emergency physician at Wake Forest. Uh, the subject of the grant is rural uh, STEMI care, and the unmet need here is that rural Americans um, receive uh, considerably worse and less timely STEMI care to the tune of uh, multiple fold. Uh, they are multiple fold less likely to get um, care within the, uh, the evidence-based recommended uh, times. Um, and that apparently uh, is persists even when you adjust for the transport time um, as compared to their urban counterparts. Um, somewhat interestingly, the unmet, unmet need in the, in the specific aims page is stated as um, us not having a clinical decision support tool, uh, which seems to me a, a little bit of putting the cart before the horse perhaps that it isn't more how do we achieve better care and more timely care for these patients. But uh, nonetheless, um, 
they, um, they are partnering with uh, a company called Pulsara that has already uh, established a track record of creating uh, digital clinical support tools, um, notably in for STEMI and stroke, but not in the pre-hospital setting. So they've published um, on uh, Stop STEMI and Stop Stroke, which are algorithms, I guess, that are designed to uh, help um, ER-based care, so uh, changing the door to balloon time or door to needle time in stroke. Um, they have some preliminary data um, that's actually very relevant, um, essentially saying that 40% of uh, patients um, in uh, the jurisdiction they looked, and I, I apologize that I actually don't remember what that was, um, somewhere in North Carolina, uh, did not uh, achieve 90-minute um, FMC to PCI time. FMC was something new to me. That's not door, but that's first medical contact. So, and I don't exactly know what the recommended guideline is, but they, re they mentioned that 40% failed to get it within 90 minutes and 11% failed to get reperfusion within 120 minutes of first medical contact. Uh, moreover, um, they, they did some qualitative work. It was a mixed method study and, um, that they've published, and they found that uh, their providers were quick to get an EKG, but then slow to activate. So it seemed like there might be something to intervene on there. And they also found that greater than 50% of the time, there was no consideration of the idea of maybe you go to a local hospital um, and get fibrinolysis uh, prior to, it, rather than just driving the longer distance and going to the, the PCI equipped center. So I thought that was uh, potentially significant and interesting. Based on that preliminary data, they put together a couple of, uh, they identified a couple of areas in which they felt that this digital clinical support tool could intervene, uh, essentially automatic uh, visual timers, um, real-time road and destination guidance to let them know how long it's likely to take them to get here or there. Um, decision support about that question I just mentioned, do we stop and go to a local hospital and get fibrinolytics, or do we take this patient the longer distance to the PCI facility? And then, of course, feedback on all of, their, uh, all of the, um, the activations that they have. Um, so that's the, the sort of uh, setup, the aims. Uh, the first one is going to be to develop the app and test its usability in a single county in North Carolina. The second one was then to roll this out um, more broadly and, uh, and actually test uh, not only usability but, but feasibility and efficacy, guided to some extent by implementation framework, uh, the re-aim implementation framework. And then aim three is actually to go back and do some qualitative work and interviews uh, trying to assess what are the barriers and facilitators uh, towards implementation of this app with an eye towards a larger multi-center, um, potentially widespread, disseminated uh, trial of this, of this uh, device or tool. Um, so uh, in general, um, I thought that it was quite a significant grant and I gave it a two on significance. Um, I think that uh, this isn't a topic that I have uh, seen a lot about, rural STEMI care, so I, I felt the, that, that it was uh, both significant and innovative in that respect. Um, and uh, innovation, I think there are other uh, clinical decision-making tools, so I gave that a three. Um, I think the investigator is, uh, you know, strong, worked in rural emergency medicine for many years, now has come back to the academic medical center, has uh, had a KL2, is interested in becoming a, um, a academic emergency physician, um, and, and so I thought that person is, uh, has a compelling story, and I gave that a three. Um, and I think the institution is generally strong. Wake Forest is an excellent research institution. There is uh, another emergency, academic emergency physician on the grant. There is a, uh, an internal medicine person that has an implementation science background that's on the grant as well, and there's a statistician on the grant. So I felt that institution-wise, they were pretty strong, and I gave that a two. My weakest uh, was their approach. Um, which I gave a five. I do think there are some strengths to their approach. I think they, as I mentioned, they have preliminary data um, that's, that's guiding uh, what they're doing. Um, and um, I think that their outcomes are, are fairly reasonable for their in terms of feasibility effectiveness. I like the fact that they're using the re-aim uh, framework in AIM-2 to assess the, uh, both the reach and the efficacy, the, um, uh, yeah, I guess effectiveness of their intervention. They have a power analysis. Um, which I felt was a strength. 
Um, my, my real weaknesses are that um, I think in the approach uh, that two, twofold. One, there's been some literature on clinical decision support tools for STEMI, um, and they incorporate uh, computer-aided um, diagnosis of the STEMI itself, analysis of the EKG. That is not included here, and um, I found that to be a weakness because that's actually been shown to increase the specificity of the STEMI, STEMI diagnosis. Um, and I, related to that, they don't make any effort to look at safety of their intervention. So, um, you know, there's a, in fact, it's not even clear to me that they would know if there were patients that are inappropriately diagnosed with STEMI. So obviously it's really important to try to increase STEMI diagnosis, but I think it's really important that this group also considers the fact that there might be cases where because of this app um, and a visual timer and all this kind of stuff that, uh, that more STEMIs might be diagnosed and you can just start to imagine what might happen then, right? So there might be a decision to go to a local hospital to get fibrinolysis only for then it to be realized that this patient actually doesn't have a STEMI. We all know that that uh, isn't a black, always a black and white diagnosis. Um, and, and so I think that's a major weakness um, and that's why I gave the, the approach a five. The initial um, point that you brought up that in the very beginning the gap was defined as there's no mobile health app um, identifies sort of a current of challenge that I think our um, slightly junior PI is demonstrating through grant writing more so than concept. Um, I think there is a limited explanation of the specific problems that this grant is going to be focusing on. What are the components? of these app going to address. You identified a few of them as I found some excellent pre preliminary work, which was done very well, um, but they didn't go to the underlying um, underpinnings or the, the um, theoretical basis for some of these reasons, and they didn't link the component of the uh, app with how it's gonna solve these problems. So what the app is supposed to do is to have an alarm reminder to get an EKG. I'm not exactly sure that that's one of the leading causes of the problems because they didn't go into that probably as much as they could have. A visible on-scene timer, a PCI center reminder, which um, you mentioned, but it seems like it's a reminder when an EKG comes up, but I'm not sure how much of that solves the problems that they're trying to solve. Um, and finally, that predict uh, prediction indicator for semi-repercussions time and a suggestion of transport location, which I agree with you. I think it's incredibly innovative and, and definitely um, this app um, with a little bit of more focus about some theoretical underpinnings and behavior change for our EMTs, um, not only the knowledge components, but how to get um, a change in time from that component would be interesting, but I don't think it's fully developed, both in the significance um, and in the application approach section in terms of uh, evaluating the initial usability um, and then feasibility. Um, I do like the use of the REAIM framework. I think that lends to a, a reproducible model. I did have a lot of questions about why just testing the usability in the beginning and not safety, as you also mentioned. Um, but I also want to say that I think some of the focus of effectiveness testing this early in an intervention implementation is concerning. A lot of their evaluation through REAIM as well as their sample size was focused on um, understanding um, effectiveness testing in an app that we haven't fully implemented nor discussed. Our sample size was focused on that, our testing was a focused on that in uh, REAIM. Um, and similarly, our usability testing in the very beginning of this app development um, is based upon a scale that doesn't have a clinical validation. Um, it's been used before and it's stated it was validated, but there's actually no clinical validation in understanding why that score is an acceptable score for usability for this component. So I have some rigor um, concerns and reproducible, reproducibility concerns. I really do enjoy his um, use of qualitative components within this implementation study. I think it's a beautifully done study. I just think that there isn't enough description of how this is done for it to be reproduced. Um, again, thus my rigor and reproducibility scores. So overall, my score of a six is mostly dri driven by his approach. My significance, I gave a three, the investigators and the innovation, a two and three respectively. My approach was a seven. I do think that the environment was excellent. The only limitation that I would um, put there is that I actually don't know why the five sites are important, what the population of each of the EMS in those sites 
um, and why we're putting this in five sites all at the same time, what that means for future implementation and evaluation studies in the next um, uh, movement. There are milestones that are listed, which is appropriate for the R21, R33, but these are more programmatic milestones rather than um, testing of the feasibility and usability. So I had a question there, but obviously that's something that can be discussed ultimately. So overall, an impact score of six. So I agree with um, all of the points made by the previous two reviewers. <coughs> the only things I would add is I, the, my biggest uh, catch up on my score was, was related to the significance um, and the focus. I mean, it, the, the implementation science of this was excellent, but in terms of the focus on this app will make this problem better without any real testing of, of that uh, hypothesis. Um, there is a little bit of an efficacy aim to a subset of aim two, but it's, it's not really a focus. And I think there's a lot put into this on this is the effective implementation, or this is the effective intervention. And, and there's not a lot known in terms of safety, but also in terms of efficacy, because really what this is is a, a timer device. It's to keep people on time. Um, they talk a little bit about in the approach that they want to help try to focus the, the direction of where the ambulance goes after they pick up these patients to the right center. Um, but the, uh, my other big concern that hasn't been mentioned much in this is the approach uh, description of how are they gonna do that. Um, nowhere in the approach do they discuss um, the, the program developers, um, who's gonna actually do the programming, how this is gonna be done. Um, and there's a big disconnect in terms of the letter from Pulsera um, and the, the, the rest of the construction of the study team to decide um, who, who is actually doing the work and who, um, with, with program development of this, this app, um, and then how is that gonna integrate with the rest of the team? It seems like the research team has been the people that have the preliminary data that says that these are the, the things that need to be impacted. The app developer is gonna develop an app that's a timer that may impact this, um, but the connection between the two sides is, is not really made clear in the proposal. Um, so that kind of drew my scores down on the approach and the significance. Otherwise, I agree. I thought the team um, was very well designed. There's a lot of strengths. The environment um, was a good environment. I thought the innovation was a little limited um, just because it seems like everything is, is already developed. The knowledge is there, why STEMI care is, is impaired in a lot of ways in, in rural EMS um, and the, the apps uh, and how they can address things with, with this sort of an electronic um, system is all in place. So innovation, though, is, is less important to me. The, the, my primary concerns are with the significance in the approach and missing the question of, is this intervention going to be helpful? Uh, I think this study would tell us very well if you can implement it or not. Um, but I think the bigger question is, is this is, is this a helpful intervention or not? It's sort of the classic mistake of deciding to do implementation research before you have a solid evidence base for what you're implementing. Yeah. I agree with what you guys are saying. Thank you, everyone. Um, it sounds like we heard some common themes um, and some pretty common um, strengths and weaknesses across the three reviewers, which the, with the common weakness um, being what Colin just summarized, um, just sort of will the, will the application address the problem? Um, but it sounds like overall the methods are fairly, it sounds like everybody agrees that the investigator team is strong, the environment is strong, and the implementation science framework and approach is methodologically sound. Um, do we have any other comments from those who are not assigned reviewers? Well, I actually have a question for, for you, it's Catherine. <laughs> I, uh, so it's interesting what you said about perhaps they're too early in testing effectiveness. I, I'm just more thinking that this is a grant that eventually should get funded, you know, needs some significant revision, needs that that I, I agree that I think some of this is the, the way that the, the, the investigator wrote the specific games. Um, hint, hint, hint for all you guys out there. <laughs> um, in, in, in terms of getting the unmet need wrong. Um, but, but you mentioned you thought that it was too early for them to test effectiveness. So what would you recommend you know, for giving them feedback on the approach? Like yeah. what should they be doing in AIM-2? Their sample size estimating to be able to have an appropriate number for efficacy testing for a 20 minute difference. Yeah. That's not necessary at this stage. That's necessary for an effectiveness testing or a trial. At this stage, you wanna see if you make any difference. You wanna make sure your patients are safe. Um, and so you, you don't need sample size estimation for that level. 
Exactly, and they could replace that effort with actually assessing yes. safety, and then yes. they'd have a much better argument yep. for their na later yep. trial. Yeah, I was also concerned a little bit about the approach of that, that they, they didn't really make clear with the before-after study how they were measuring these factors before. So what was the determina determination of first medical contact before? Clearly something determined that. Is that changing now that they have a button that says first medical contact? Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of observer bias in this, the way it's written now, that at least is not addressed right now, that really needs to be addressed um, to, to kind of sort out how is the before, after, or any sort of a comparison that gets to efficacy and safety, how are those groups similar as opposed to we just have observer bias because now we're hitting a button every time we have this metric that we're supposed to hit. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something else that wasn't really addressed in that approach. That True. Yeah, I think the early phase with just focusing on usability really misses out on a lot of this understanding of when I put this into place, what actually now happens. So as you're saying, observing this from the beginning all the way through the end and understanding how many are actually going to use it because they use a large portion of their second um, part of their testing to just say, okay, we just want half of the people to use it. That is one of their outcomes. Um, does that mean just use it? the start, but then ignore it afterwards, that's not described. Um, we don't know if people are going to want to use it or not want to use it, and a lot of that information I think has to happen up front so we can start that discussion of usability um, by incorporating, okay, usability is just turning it on, or usability is really using each component of it, and how is each component of it going to fit together. So I think sort of the, the underlying framework of getting that app um, more both written well, as you said, in terms of team together to do it but then um, going more in-depth in each component of the app itself and understanding how that works in the system. Just to, as we're throwing out ideas for the proposal too, the, um, the other thing I thought that could have been flushed out more as a possibility for how this could be used is they talked about the, the GPS guidance to the closest PCI capable versus fibrinolytic capable yep. facility. Um, that sounded kind of like just a GPS physical location thing, but there's so much more integrated into that. Is that cath lab available? Um, do they have space? Is that team come in in a re reliable amount of time? Um, if there's some way they can integrate other factors into that, I think that would be a much more helpful app for the, the EMS folks to, um, to call and go to the right center. Um, because if you go to a center that is 89 minutes away, um, and they routinely always have somebody on the table and it's always a delay of 20 or 30 minutes to, to get somebody in and, and get the cath done, are they available or are they not? And do you need to take them to fibrinolysis first? I thought that would have been something that was helpful that wasn't really addressed. It was, it was seemed more to be a GPS focused sort of thing. Yeah, even just a phone call. Yeah. Yeah, even just a phone call to somebody who would be able to sort of risk stratify or, yeah. or, or burden stratify. Agreed completely. Any other comments, questions? I, I mean, I guess I feel, I'm, I'm more positive, I think, but I, I feel like it would be fine if they were to argue that what the unmet need is that like we need to figure out a way to improve timely care for rural patients, right? And as opposed to saying the unmet need is not having the tool. And then to say, look, we want to develop a tool so we can test it, right? And I think that's sort of what you're getting at, unless I'm misunderstanding, is, is that maybe focus more on uh, on, on those aspects in preparation for a trial where you're really going to generate the evidence, is this what's going to do it for rural STEM care? So I, I, I think it's, to me, this is not a premise issue. I think this is a reasonable, yeah. As is typical for Dr. Van Epps in these things, he always picks the right <laughs> question to ask in these things, and, and I disagree. I, I do have concern about the premise um, and whether this timer intervention is going to have a significant impact. 
Um, and I don't think the, the investigators describe how they, they have the, the data that backs up that these things need to improve, um, but they don't really describe how they expect that to Im this app to impact um, those, those outcomes. Um, so I think, I think there is a hole there that, that could still be filled. And, and that also gets to my, my comments about what is this GPS app doing? Does it integrate a lot of different things or is this just something like find the nearest cath lab on my phone and I can go there? Is, th is that what it's um, functioning to do or is there something else it adds besides a timer and an iPhone GPS? Um, and it wasn't well described. That could be what's going on, but I think it needs to be fleshed out a little bit more. Yeah, I specifically said I think it's a grant writing thing because to be perfectly honest, I think that what's written is I have this app and it can solve all your problems. It's actually written. Um, and I loved it. I highlighted it because it made me smile. But what is not identified is the specific components of the challenge along the route of the EMS process, which can then be solved. But before we even get to solve it, we under have to understand what impacts that. So let's say they don't one of the things is inertia to move fast when someone is really sick. Well, there's a lot of things that make you not move fast when someone's sick. You don't identify the reason that they're sick. You don't know that you moving fast will make a difference. But there wasn't that underlying description of all of the reasons that go into that not moving fast. So I don't know if someone just having a timer on the wall is gonna make a difference. And so the theoretical underpinning for me is like, what are the things that make people move faster? If it's a sign on the wall and there's good evidence on that, then I can see the logical thought from the problem to the reasons that are causing the problem to the solutions that'll fit through those reasons. And so that sort of the thought process, I don't see that there. I could imagine that it is there. So I, I'm not sure if that's a scientific premise or it's just not well described. Um, it might be there and just not brought out very well. Um, but a better delineation of that thought process for each component of the app, never mind describing what the app actually does, more in depth to solve those problems would be really helpful. And it's a great example of that. Everyone agrees it's an important problem. I think it's a significant, but the approach yeah. may not be an obvious correct approach. The other, the, 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 the other way, this is exactly what goes on in the study session. It's really, it's, these guys are just... <laughs> <laughs> I think all of the comments we've heard today have asked for more. The problem is we're already up against the page limit here. Um, so I definitely would say if you're given the page limits, use them. Um, there's probably always more you can say and more questions you can answer. The more you spell things out for your reviewers, um, the better they will understand your grant. So if you're given a page limit, you can be a little bit under it, but you should probably use most of it. And if you're not using it, it probably means that your grant is a little bit underdeveloped and there are areas where you could provide more detail. The challenge with this grant is that there is a lot of detail and it is very well written and it does take up the full amount of space. And you can see that even in that setting, we're still asking for more. So it's a t it's now, now becomes the challenging part, trying to figure out how to answer, how to address all these concerns um, while still fitting within the page limit. You get a one extra page when you resubmit, though, and boy, is that one <laughs> extra page important because you get to you get to answer exactly what. Then you know what the reviewers yeah. want, and you get to come back and answer them. Yeah. Can you resubmit and make it like a line by line talk, which yeah. for in groups like paper, like you can't do one set X and then X. No, you have one page, you don't so have you only have one page to rebut. So you gotta. But I'll tell you one important thing that I didn't know until I started submitting a lot of. Uh, grants the NIH, which is th why it's so important to get discussed um, at the study section. Because I just got a grant back that, you know, two of the reviewers really liked, and one of them hated it, 
right? And one of them just was like, I don't think this drug is ever going to work because I just don't think it's going to. You know, and I, like, I just don't believe in the whole premise of this, right? And it but pulled it down from getting discussed, right? No, no, no. It oh, got, got discussed. Disc oh, it got discussed. I've had that thing you don't get discussed and yeah. you don't really know what the, yeah. the real perception of the study section is. You just yeah. get, this is great and this is terrible. Right. <laughs> and that's why it was so key that I got discussed yeah. because that reviewer's comments of like the 52 comments that that person made, one of them made it into the general. So you, the summary first thing you get is the summary statement that is written by the whole study section. And they did take one of that person's comments, uh, the, the most addressable one, and they put that in my summary statement. So, but, but I think that's really important. But yeah, it is not a line by line. You get to edit your grant. You can change whatever you want in your grant, but you only get a one page rebuttal to just respond to what they say. Yeah. I still haven't decided exactly how I'm going to respond to the guy that said, I just think your idea is wrong. Yeah, I haven't figured that one out yet. I'm meeting with the PO next week, and I'm going to sign a subtly say, hey, what do you think about Reviewer 3? You know, like, you were there. Uh, I think I, I know what she's going to say. I think the other thing to consider when you have those uh, 
contrasting reviews is that if two thirds of the reviewers liked it, if you change too much, they may those two thirds who did like it may not like it when you resubmit it. Um, so it's always it's a balancing act. I don't think there's a perfect answer. Um, but that said, let's move on. So reviewers, let's have you give your revised impact score, overall impact yep, score. Yeah, I'm going to come down to a five. I'm going to stay at a six. I'll stay at a five. So our range for voting, if all of you were part of the study section voting, your range would be to vote between a five and a six. Um, if any of you really liked a proposal or really were swayed um, by arguments that it has critical weaknesses, you could at this time say, I'm going to vote outside range. I want to give it a four. I want to give it a seven. Um, and just kind of state that. And then everybody would enter their scores into the system. Um, once all the scores are entered, um, do we have any human subjects or budgetary concerns? I was a little bit concerned that the budget didn't structure any money into it for the app development, um, which kind of underlied some of my critiques about um, how is this being done? Is this grant money for app development, or is this just to support the research team and study the implementation science? Um, and, and then how is that going to be affected downstream of who can use this, this NIH-supported app um, downstream if it's purely the intellectual property of the, the developer? That was a I think that's the more relevant control is, is uh, concern. If the NIH is. supports this and it's a great system, then where does it go from there um, if there's no no money to the app development? Wait, wait, just to clarify. If the NIH supports this, yeah. then if, if there were money for Pulsara from the NIH, then they'd have to make it available widely is what you're saying. I would hope so. Right. But Whereas I mean, now that there's yeah. no money for Pulsara, yeah. maybe they're planning on developing it as a private, you know, as a proprietary product or something like that. But then if that's the case, then what's the role of the NIH money for right, the right, project? Right. <laughs> Any closing comments? I think those are valid concerns about the budget that we would feed back, yeah. um, feed back to the applicant. But again, are discussed after we put in our final impact score. And just a, again, a reminder of confidentiality. Um, we were great, gracious. To, we're grateful to have this application to review. I think this is a really valuable experience for all of you to see um, the way a grant is discussed. Um, but this is a grant that we, someone is submitting for review. So again, confidentiality is in critical. Um, and yeah, same, and same with all of the other um, pages that you've seen today and discussions that you've had today. Um, these are people's sort of intellectual, this is their research work. Um, so we want to create a space where people are comfortable sharing and both providing and receiving feedback, but please treat it with some confidentiality. I was just going to say many thanks to Dr. Tobira for having the yeah. guts to give his grant application up here. This is tough. Well, we thank all heard that. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Huge applause, yeah. especially to the attendees. <laughs> thank you for sharing. So all of us are learning here today. and. I'm a junior researcher myself, so what I learn every time is your mentor, right? Your mentor is so important. And we are so lucky to have our top researchers in our field in the room with us today. So take advantage of that, all right? Because you really don't know what you don't know. You don't know what to look for, right? So, all right, let's go to the final um, thing we have here. We're gonna go over some questions. Let's see how much you guys learned. Thank you, guys. All right, so we just need to, for CME, we need to answer some questions. All right, CME questions. Number one, you are given an opportunity to apply for a small 10,000 pilot grant with a local foundation. Which of the following is most likely? A, the pilot grant will certainly lead to a large NIH R01. B, you'll be able to complete a multi-center trial you planning, you've been planning, and C, successful small grants will improve your credibility to obtain larger grants. Anybody know the answer? C, very good. C, so the key is apply for small grants. Okay, start with small grants. Next question is true or false? Investigator-initiated industry or foundation grants 
can be easier to apply to compare to federal grants. Yep, it's true. Question three, which of the following is not a role served by the institutional institute program officer? So not, okay, what do they not do? Provide advice on what to do if your application scores above the pay line. B, provide additional insight into discussing, uh, I'm sorry, into discussion, especially if program officer was at the review meeting. C, institute program officer is not allowed to attend review meetings and are unable to provide insights into discussion. Or D, institute program officers may inform the probability of you receiving a grant funding. Which one do they not do? Exactly. They are allowed to attend review meetings and provide you with insights, all right? So it's so important that you get to know your program officers. Four, which of the following describes the role served by the Institute Council? A, do they provide advice to the director on policy matters and scientific opportunities? B, recommend concurrence or non-concurrence with initial review group evaluation, I'm sorry, evaluation of applications for support of research and research training. C, provided, provided redress or real or apparent errors that may have occurred during the initial review. D, all above are rules served by the Institute Council. You guys remember what they do? This was from Dr. Brown's lecture. So the answer is actually all above. They do all the following. Okay. If by any chance you are not funded on the first attempt, what should you do next? A, you revise and resubmit. B, <laughs> resubmit. <laughs> do not resubmit or give up on research. Uh, uh, yes, A. Okay, all the following are true statements regarding specific AIMS page except, so AIMS page serves as a concept sheet with a project milestones, hypothesis, and a master plan for the research proposal, and ideally engages the reader as an advocate during review. B, it's a simple figure such as conceptual model or relationship among key variables are encouraged to save words and provide visual reinforcement. C, all AIMS page should educate the non-expert reader on existing literature, identify a knowledge gap, propose a solution grounded in the AIMS, or D, AIMS page should be written to an educated non-expert audience, saving the field specific details for content experts in later sections, or E, all the above are true statements regarding the specific AIMS page. So the answer is actually E, all of above. So this is um, the goal. This should all be, or yeah, except. All of them are true statement except for um, they're all true statement, okay? All the following are true statements regarding NIH BioSketch, except A, describe the magnitude and significance of investigators' scientific contribution, including publications and detailed information about investigators' research experience in the context of the proposed project. B, figures, tables, and graphics are not allowed. C, BioSketch are only required to be submitted by the principal investigator. Or D, may not exceed five pages per person or E, all of above are true statements regarding the NIH biosketch. Yep, it's C, I heard it. All right, true or false. The NIH grant application scoring system uses a nine point scale for both overall impact score and score for the individual criteria score. 1.0 is an exceptional score and 9.0 is a poor score. Five is a good medium impact application and considered an average score. True or false? Yep, true. Now, which of the following is not one of the section of the individual scoring review criterion? A, significance, B, investigator, C, innovation, D, approach, E, environment, or 
F, all above are part of the NIH individual scoring review criteria. Yep, exactly, F. Okay, the following five grants were all reviewed at an NIH SRG review meeting. Which of the following final application score is considered the best score in this group and most likely to be funded? Exactly, the lower, remember, lower the score, the better. Okay, all NIH grants are discussed by SRG as a group at the meeting, at the review and no grants are triage. Exactly. All the following are true statements regarding impact score except discussed applications received numerical impact score from all uh, eligible reviewers. B, the impact score of an application is based on each individual reviewer's assessment of the score criteria only. only. Additional criteria regarding the protection and inclusion of human subjects, vertebrate animal care and welfare, biohazards and criteria specific to the funding opportunity are not included in the impact score. C, reviewers are guided to use the full range of rating scale and spread their scores to better discriminate among applications. D, reviewers whose evaluation or opinion of an application fall outside the range of the opinion of those, sorry, presented by the assigned reviewers and discussants should ensure that their opinions are brought to the attention of the entire committee. Or E, the SRO and chairperson should ensure that all opinions are voiced before final scoring is conducted. So which are all the statements are true except for which one? Which, what's the false statement? So the false statement is actually B because um, the impact score is based on each, it's not based on the, each score only, it's on a summary score and it does not include the human subject and ver vertebrae or additional criteria are, are, um, are included but not in, in, are in part of it. Does that make sense? But this is the false statement. Okay. Okay, and that's it. All right, so I need all of you guys to register for your CME on this. Uh, this. I'm going to help you guys register for your CME. And then we're done. Any questions? Anybody have any questions right now? All right, so you might want to take a picture of this. Um, to obtain the CME for this session, you have to log in to the app or website, locate the Claim CME button on your app, or in the left navigation field of the website, select Certificate Type and click on Complete the Survey for the Workshop Form Attended. Find the correct survey in the list and unlock it with the code grant. I'm sorry. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah, here, so you guys can take a picture of it. This is the instructions. And then uh, complete the survey, click on the certificate to download and print. This, is, this must be done no later than July 31st, all right? And this is all I have. Thank you so much again, and thank you for the attendee who share again their grant. This is such a great discussion that actually takes place in our review sessions. And so I hope you guys learn, and you, um, you guys have the contacts of the the, uh, some of our mentors, so keep in touch with them. And all right, any qu uh, questions? Yeah. Um, I would guess it's the SAE. I'm not, they didn't tell me on which. I'm guessing the SAEM app. I mean the website SAEM. Try that, and then locate claim CME. Thank you, everyone, and again, thank you so much for, to the faculty mentors. They're amazing. You guys will see, you'll see familiar faces and hear their names. Um, and then thank you for all the attendees today.
hope to see you guys, your papers and your grants someday. All right. Okay, that's all. I'm going to leave this up for a little bit. Uh -huh.